Welcome to Open Minds Radio with Alejandro Rojas. Open Minds Radio is your UFO news authority, presenting evidence and the latest news regarding the UFO phenomenon. Here's your host, Alejandro Rojas. Alejandro Rojas, that is I, and this is Open Minds Radio, and we are very happy to have you with us today. We have a great, I was really excited, I was so I was able to get today's guest um, so quickly to sign up and to get on the show, and that is David Paris. I read about him a few weeks ago because he did a conference at the University of Nebraska in Omaha. It was kind of a small little affair that he did with his colleague, Dr. Jack Kasher, who is a physicist at UNO. That's the what they call the University of Nebraska in Omaha. We'll call it UNO from here on out for your reference. But, uh, you know, these are a couple professors at the school, and there probably are not too many universities out there, if any other universities out there, that have a couple professors that are so into the UFO subject and paranormal overall that they have little conferences. How cool is that? So that was really exciting to see that. Got a hold of David Paris. It turns out... He uh, is an adjunct professor. He teaches at several schools. He teaches on astronomy, astrology, geology, all of these ologies. He doesn't have a class on ufology, but he he loves UFOs. But they do have a radio show, a student radio show on paranormal and UFOs. And he has a radio show there uh, on astronomy. They do all this paranormal investigation. He has his own theory about ufos and and the propulsion and believes that some of these bermuda triangle stories where we they planes have said they've kind of flown into a vortex and then showing up miles away from where they were supposed to be uh could lend some uh, vital evidence as to the nature of the technologies that ufos are using very interesting very high-level scientific stuff that he gets into, which honestly goes a little bit over my head here and there. Maybe I should have the Giorgio Tukulos hair that goes a little higher so I can catch those physics things that don't go over my head. But uh, So he's a great, great guy, and I'm really happy to have him on the show today. We'll be talking to him later about all of the topics that I mentioned earlier. So this is going to be a lot of fun, people. And here again, this is someone, he's been on Coast to Coast, but, you know, there's a lot of these great people out there who haven't done a whole lot of inform- uh, of interviews and stuff, but they just have this amazing information, and they're really cool, incredible people. We love cool, incredible people, and we got another one today. So we'll have him later on in the show, and we're going to give him a little more time than normal. So we're going to get straight into one of uh, everybody's favorite parts of the show, and that is the news from our UFO news correspondent, Jason McClellan. Hello, Jason. And sometimes I also fall in the cool, incredible category, right? Oh, for sure. All right. That's a given, buddy. Just had to check. So cool, so credible. Appreciate it. Jason McClellan. Well, greetings, everyone. This is your Open Minds News Brief for Monday, April 9th, 2012. Start up with some UFO sightings today. Mm -hmm. A flying saucer was recently photographed uh, emerging from the smog in Beijing. Uh, The photographer reportedly took the photo of this UFO from an overpass with a cell phone camera. And the witness claims to have been focused on the traffic below so the flying saucer wasn't discovered until the witness reviewed the photo on his phone. Um, this photo was published by the website io9. Um, they republished it from another site, but they were unable to locate the witness's statements anywhere other than uh, the Canadian. And for those of you who don't know, the Canadian's this online newspaper that uh, likes to advertise itself as being an alternative news source, and they really accept submissions from anybody, and they publish anything. So their information is is less than credible, so it's up to you to decide if you want to believe that or not. But, uh, yeah, interesting photo. I mean, the, the, this UFO in this photo is 
like your old-fashioned flying saucer kind of coming out of the smog. But. Yeah, it's so hard to say with such little uh, information. Right. But if that is real and this thing was able to survive this dense uh, pollution over Beijing, that is some advanced technology, that is for sure. Good ventilation. Yes. Good ventilation. Well, I don't know if, well, I'm pretty sure you, you've noticed this, Alejandro, there seems to, in the past couple of weeks, been a lot of video taken from airplanes mm. of UFOs mm-hmm. out the airplane windows. Um, there was video of UFO recorded by an airplane passenger on a flight that was over Canberra, Australia on April 4th. And the video shows a small white object and you can't really see much detail. It's kind of far away, and it moves very quickly. It zooms past the airplane, flying at a lower altitude than, uh, than the airplane itself. Um, you see the video, then you see this white thing just go like under, sort of below the, where the airplane is flying. No detail at all, even if you slow it down and go frame by frame uh, with this, this video. So impossible to tell anything with that one either um you know it's going at an incredible rate of speed um some people have also pointed out that this uh there could be an indication that that this video in particular could be a hoax because at the very beginning of the video if you look at the far left of the screen where this object you know from the direction this object comes it at the very beginning of the video you already see the object there just, oh, really? just for the first second of the video. The object is there, and as the plane goes, you know, it falls off the screen and then zooms by. So it's possible, I guess, that that thing was there, but it kind of goes with the plane too, like, but not moving. So it could be an indication that it's a glitch from some animation done mm. to the video, but, you know, that's, that's undetermined. Could be a hint, though. But that's just one of many that have happened in the past couple of weeks. There was even one today from, uh, I think, South Korea. Mm-hmm. South Korea. Um, so I don't know what it is. I mean, I think, you know, these things have been in the news a lot. And that, that one was even covered by uh, the Daily Mail, I think. Yeah, the hard part is we had the one uh, a few weeks ago uh, that kind of started this craze. And this was a gentleman. That was Amsterdam, right? That was so. Amsterdam. And supposedly this guy flew from Amsterdam to his home in Dallas. In Dallas, took some video of his peppers and his tree. And then the next day, or I think it was even the same day, posted that picture in his video. I mean, all in the same day of of, of flying back from Amsterdam. So, and that one kind of looks a little suspect. So I don't know. It all started from this. And sometimes, you know, especially in the news, it's like that. There are, or with trends like this, you know, there's a video that gets popular and then lots of people come and fake stuff. But, yeah, I don't know. The the um, Australian one looks kind of cool. I mean, it looks kind of interesting. So, um, yeah, it's really hard to say. You certainly have more people. You know, everybody has a, a cell phone now. Most have cameras. Yeah. And, you know, I think there are a fair number of people who do look out the window for things. I know I certainly do every time I'm on an airplane. I'm like, hmm, mm, it'd be cool to see something out there. But, you know, I certainly don't have my camera just shooting out my plane window hoping something will fly in front of it. That's the other odd thing about these videos, that they happen to just be shooting the nothingness out their window, mm-hmm. and then something happens to fly in front of it. I mean, I guess I can see that some people want to record the sky because it is cool flying yeah. above the clouds and everything. It, yep. it does look awesome. So, you know, I, that doesn't necessarily mean that something is not genuine. But I don't do that, but I'm sure there are people who do. And so they, you know, there's always that chance that they could catch something. Yeah, and the hard part is is a lot of these have not gotten, or none of these, for the mo- I don't think any of them come from reliable sources as far as reporting or anything either. I'm not sure where the one, the original source today was, the one that was in the Daily Mail. Um, yeah, because the Daily Mail, as we know, is not that great of a source I even think either. their original source might have been YouTube as well, and that's mm-hmm. where a lot of them get yeah. this initial information, and they even cite that is, well, the video on YouTube shows in the video information, and then they'll say, and, and more times than not, that uh, YouTube channel that it's on is some 
UFO sighting channel. Yeah. So who knows where they're getting their information from either. Yeah. What would what is great from these better credible news sources is when they talk to the witness and they do some sort of investigation. Right. And at least with a bigger news source, they uh they have to do that sort of thing before posting a story. Even you know our good buddy Lee Spiegel or. Uh, does a lot more research than most of these places that just kind of pull something off of YouTube and say, here's what YouTube says and decide for yourself. Yeah. Because they, ha they have the money. That's what's frustrating. They can at least try to get some analysis done, but they never do, unfortunately. And getting that firsthand witness testimony counts for a lot. Yeah. You know, when you're just getting off some random YouTube channel, yeah. the witness said this, and you've got no other source for that testimony. Yeah. Yeah. It's difficult. Well, I've got another UFO sighting here, and this is well, this isn't really a sighting, but it's a, a, a possible UFO crash. Uh, an Argentinian farmer recently filed a complaint with local authorities. He alleges that a UFO landed in his cornfield, leaving behind a six-foot-wide path of crushed corn plants that extends for nearly 2,000 feet. There are also witnesses who claim they saw quote a ship with strange lights and colors flying over the area end quote. But unfortunately, and this sucks for the farmer. None of these witnesses have officially testified on behalf of the farmer. Hmm. So they say they saw it, but they won't take the time to go down to City Hall or whatever for this guy's like case and say, "Hey, they, this is I what wonder we what saw. they're afraid of." So I don't, I don't, either, I don't know either. But the the officials say that because they're not uh, officially going on the record, it's made it for a difficult case. Uh huh. So this poor guy is is out his uh his corn. And he can't get any help because people aren't. What an interesting story, though, because, I mean, it can't be easy to crush all that corn in a six foot, you know. It's a very interesting case. Blank. And they, they've even gone out and investigated and, and found no tire tracks. Yeah. Um, there's no other, you know, possible reason for it. They said that sometimes similar things will happen and people will steal people's crops. But mm -hmm. there was no no crop theft, no tire tracks. Just crush. Just this long sort of Swat. pathway where something crashed into it. Hmm. So. That's very strange. It would be cool if more people come forward because apparently multiple people say they saw some yeah. sort of craft with multicolored lights. When was this story? I don't think I actually saw it. It was just reported uh, today. Um, I believe it happened a week ago. Okay. Yeah, so hopefully more people will uh, come forward and we'll get some more information. Yeah, because it sounds like a good case and they're actually yeah. investigating it. Yeah, cool. Oh. Well, Various discoveries by NASA and other organizations during the past few years have generated considerable interest within the mainstream media and the general public in the search for extraterrestrial life. Mm -hmm. NASA's Kepler Space Telescope has been on a planning hunting mission since 2009, searching for Earth-like planets. The mission has already confirmed the discovery of 61 planets and found more than 2,000 planetary candidates. And recent data from the European uh, Southern Observatory, uh, their HARPS, their High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher Planet Hunting Telescope, as we discussed last week, suggest there are tens of billions of Earth-like planets in our galaxy alone, many thought to have the correct conditions to support life. And these recent, recent discoveries have excited scientists and are fueling additional efforts to search for life elsewhere in the universe. The Canadian Astrobiology Network, known as CAN, uh, centered at the University of Western Ontario, announced last week a partnership with NASA. The press release from Cannes stated, quote, a number of extraterrestrial targets, including Mars and the moons Europa and Titan, have been identified by NASA as having the potential to host life or to provide valuable insight for researchers and scientists into the conditions that may have been present on Earth when life started, end quote. As an affiliate within the NASA Astrobiology Network, CAN hopes to, quote, strengthen existing ties, facilitate the establishment of new collaborations, and enhance training opportunities for both Canadian and American researchers and students. And uh, more exciting, though, to me, and probably you, Alejandro, last week, was the announcement that the Kepler mission, that we talk about a lot on this show, will continue at least through 2016. It was originally scheduled to conclude later this year, but NASA announced that funding for Kepler is being extended. And Space.com explains, NASA's prolific Kepler Space Observatory, which has found signs of thousands of alien planets, will keep hunting strange new worlds for at least four more years. So that is awesome news. Go Kepler. Hooray, Kepler. But they did, I think there were, there were four or, or even more perhaps programs that they recently extended. These are programs that were scheduled to be scrapped, um, funding cut, but 
they've been so successful that they've decided to continue them because there's so much data still being collected by these programs, Kepler specifically. Yeah, yeah, they're good. It's it's exciting. So exciting. All right, and let's see. The search for extraterrestrial life is a major component to space exploration, but some scientists are specifically searching for our relatives. Hmm. Space.com reports that a team of researchers is searching for, quote, siblings of the sun, stars born from the same parent star cluster, because they may have been seeded with life from Earth. Hmm. So the idea, known as panspermia, and we've mentioned that on the show before, isn't a new idea. Um, and it's actually an idea some scientists think that's how life on Earth may have began from panspermia. Right. Seeds from other things spreading to Earth. The process of panspermia is explained to space.com by astronomer Mari Valtonen of the University of Turku in Finland. And he states, the idea is if a, plant, uh, if a planet has life, like Earth, and if you hit it with an asteroid, it will create debris, some of which will escape into space. And if the debris is big enough, like one meter across, it can shield life inside from radiation, and that life can survive inside for millions of years until that debris lands somewhere. If it happens to land on a planet with suitable conditions, life can start there. Valtonen and his team theorized that if Earth was bombarded by comets and asteroids long ago, life-bearing debris could have transferred to other planets when other stars were much closer to our own. And Space.com explains, quote, that means somewhere out there in the galaxy might be your long-lost cousin. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, they don't really mean like if a piece of Earth breaks off and, you know, you and your family get a tri free trip to Zeta Reticuli. You'd probably die, but Hang the bacteria, on, yeah, but the bacteria inside of your belly and body would probably live on, and uh, it would make it, and uh, that's what we go forward. Panspermia. It's an interesting theory. You know, yeah, it's it, cool. It, to a lot of scientists, it makes sense. Oh yeah, I was wondering where you're going with that too, because I was going to say if they're looking for my relatives, they're in Globeville, in Denver. Not too hard to find. Well, this is just some scientists. It's not okay. at all, and you know there are some. Far out scientists. Yeah, it's a great theory, and a lot of people feel, and there have been arguments that, of course, that's where life came from here, which makes sense because that's what we see in, here. Lots of life made it to, um, like, uh, uh, Hawaii, which was the volcano that came up, and then coconuts and things floated over there and, and sprung life. Alejandro, let me squeeze in one more story before I'm done here. All right. Up. That is extraterrestrial life could be hiding in recently discovered lava tubes <gasps> on Mars. Photos taken by the European Space Agency's Mars Express spacecraft reveals rows of, quote, pit chambers, or pit, pit chains, as they're called, lining the sides of volcanoes in the red planet's uh, Tharsis region. These pit chains were likely caused by ancient vol volcanic activity, and the ESA explains, quote, lava streaming from volcano volcanoes solidifies on the surface, leaving a molten tube of lava running below. Once volcanic activity ceases, the tubes empty, leaving behind a subterranean cavity. Similar lava tubes were discovered last year on our very own moon by NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Mm -hmm. And these pit chambers could have also formed due to strains in the planet's crust or even as a result of groundwater leading to the collapse of surface rocks. Right. So scientists believe tubes like these could provide a safe environment for life. Jason Major of Universe Today explains, quote, even though the surface of Mars can receive 250 times the radiation levels found on Earth, the layers of soil and rock surrounding the tubes can provide adequate protection for life, whether it be ancient Martian microbes or future explorers from Earth. Hmm. And I think that's really where our astronauts are going to go with, with the moon and Mars, you know, in, in terms of colonizing and building, yeah. building these colonies is subterranean structures. And they might find subterranean caverns. Full of life and trees and animals and creatures, wouldn't that be? I think amazing? the underground worlds there are, are probably pretty substantial, and yeah. you know, I think there's a lot of water down there. I mean, yeah. that's what they're determining with both the moon Could and be Mars. Tropical, so. like journey to the center of the Earth. Yeah, exactly. Paradise. Fascinating. You bet. All right, guys. Well, that is it for the news for today. Remember, you can check out all these stories and so many more at OpenMinds.tv, your source for UFO-related news. I'm Jason McClellan, your Open Minds news correspondent. And you've just been briefed. Back to you, Alejandro. Thank you, Jason. Always a fascinating look into the news of the week. 
I want to catch you up real quick before we get to our interview on a couple of things that our good buddies have been up to. Uh, Leslie Kane had an interesting post from Facebook that uh, one of the guys from East Skeptic, George Michael, actually wrote a positive review about her book on UFOs, um, generals, other important people on the record. I can't remember all the people that they talked about, but government officials and stuff talking about UFOs. And uh, so there's a spark to debate. So Robert Schaefer, this other skeptic uh, out there, is real upset. And uh, the skeptics are debating her book. So that's kind of exciting. Also, Lee Spiegel, we talked about this story last week in Las Vegas where uh, people believe they they filmed some UFOs, but it might be birds or something caught in the light uh, of the Luxor. Lee Spiegel was actually there, and he got his own pictures and video, so if you go to his, uh, Huffington Post or if you look at my UFO Daily News tweets, you'll see his story on that. So some interesting stuff that our friends are up to. One of our new friends is David Paris from the University of Nebraska. Let's go ahead and get him on the line. I am very happy to have a uh, professor at University of Nebraska in Omaha, David Paris, and you have been in studying UFOs for a long time. Oh, yeah, ever since I was 16. <laughs> oh, really? So what was it that originally got you into all of this? Well, actually, a sighting. Mm -hmm. um, at 16 years old, I had a uh, sighting in August of 1969, and with a number of other people, we were getting ready to go to a swim class um, up to Milford, New York. This actually took place at Goodyear Lake uh, in uh, New York State in the Catskill Mountains. Uh, it's probably about like uh, 20 miles south of Cooperstown, the uh, Baseball Hall of Fame. And that, on a um, brilliant morning, no clouds in the sky and um, very nice, uh, you know, very cold temperatures. Uh, we saw this uh, craft come over the mountain about uh, 100 feet above and was about 500 feet off the ground, around 1,000 feet down from us, down range of us. And uh, it was a, a silver discus-shaped object about 60 feet in diameter, about a 12-foot girth, perfect flight dynamics. I mean, just this thing was just solid and it was flying about 20 miles an hour. And so you have... Um, several seconds to see this thing and then as it came over to our position it banked about 20 degrees and you could see the top of it but there were no appendages no uh, greenhouse no glass no smoke no nothing you know it was all very quiet there was only one slight noticeable sound was like air buffing off the surface but i didn't realize how that actually occurred until i was taking glider lessons and the same kind of sound as you hear air coming over the surface of the wings of the craft and on the fuselage and uh, it's a very very similar like sound but very very subtle you know um, but as it righted up after it passed our position it just just went out and increased its velocity to um, you know thousands of miles an hour and it just went and disappeared <clears throat> ever since that time I've been fascinated by what made that thing fly and I really kind of it did it, it actually changed my life in the fact that I was um, heavy participant in sports and wrestling and football and um, and I just quit everything and went into science math and engineering and all my other um, you know degree pursuits of you know uh, been honing my skills essentially is to try to figure out how this thing actually the propulsion system and how it flew and I've been just absolutely absorbed with this all my life mm -hmm. so I've, I've gathered tremendous amounts of information and um, I guess one of my hobbies or researches that I do and I guess I've been um, you know doing radio shows and television programs on this is the space warp that, that seems to be the big uh, my focus right now is I believe that we have definite proof that space warp can occur from a natural phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to demonstrate how we can um, exercise that phenomena and try to art artificially induce it. So it's, uh, it's been a fascinating uh, journey. 
Yeah, one of the things I definitely want to get into that, but uh, I didn't tackle myself all of the things that you do because you do a lot. You're a MUFON section director. Uh, mm -hmm. It looks like I don't know if you still do adjunct work at all of these other schools, but at uh, several yes, other do. schools out there. So you're, you're and in many fields, physics, meteorology. Maybe if you could tell us some of what you do, give us uh, as much as you can. Uh, a briefing of your bio. You're doing a lot of stuff. Well, I guess my big problem is everything fascinates me. Mm -hmm. There's not too many things that don't. And so as a result, um, you know, I've, I've developed and honed the skills in astronomy and physics and math and uh, geography and uh, geology. I teach uh, 10 different subjects at, at college level. And I, I right now I teach at four different colleges here locally and uh, I do online development courses for distant education and I teach face-to-face -face classes and it's a kind of a jungle, juggling act to you know get everything uh, to align in a schedule that makes sense mm -hmm. <laughs> and I guess during the year I teach about uh, it varies depending upon if a class fills or you know gets canceled out but I teach somewhere between 68 to 75 semester hours a year. Wow, so definitely a busy guy. I was happy. When I saw everything you do, uh, you know, and I, I emailed you, I thought, this is a busy guy. I'm, I hope I, I can catch him at, when he's free. So I'm very fortunate and glad you were able to have some time to do this. You also, then, I, I was wondering a little bit more about your Omaha UFO study group. Is that directly associated with MUFON or is it just is it something that you and some students have put together well actually it, it's a combination of, of all of these things and mm -hmm. what's unique about the clubs at the uh, University of Nebraska at Omaha is that they really uh, encourage clubs to um, combine community related groups to their club mm -hmm. so we call them community alliance groups and what's beautiful about the um, UNO UFO study group is that we have as an alliance group the Omaha UFO study group and uh, also MUFON. So those two uh, major groups uh, always participating in the club meetings. Um, everybody is welcome. And then they have their specific um, club meetings for MUFON held at the same location that we have for the club meetings as well. So they indirectly get the benefit of utilizing the facility, the internet, all the computers, big screen projectors, and all this type of thing. So it works out as a very beneficial for all the groups that participate. And, and it's the same thing for the, uh, the UNO Paranormal Society. Uh, we have over nine community alliance groups that do, do ghost hunting and uh, investigative work in that. And all of these groups have come together and shared all kinds of um, information about equipment, cases. Uh, we have our own uh, case studies that we do onto the campus itself and collecting data and analyzing it. And so one of our major goals is to try to figure out on the paranormal side is to w what actually is involved in the physics of the EVPs. We've, we've built a lot of specialized equipment from scratch to analyze this stuff and uh, to try to, to pri try to put some kind of quantitative, uh, you know, tag on this. You know, how does this thing really work? And on the UFO side, there's a lot of commonality between the two groups and the amount of equipment and the types of equipment that we use. So we've developed a, um, a laptop, portable laptop, that you can uh, attach a variety of uh, a suite of sensors to it, and we uh, have built a interface board, a USB board to the laptop, and the fact that you can, you know, tie all these pieces of equipment to it is uh, has kind of revolutionized the ability of the clubs to do things um, and to go out and to study certain situations. And um, we've also developed some image processing techniques, and these image processing techniques again cross the board on both clubs which is uh, very interesting because our whole go goal has been to prove whether imagery that we're looking at is a real picture or has it been tampered, photoshopped. 
And I can't tell you how many hundreds of these photos that we get on a week-to-week -week basis have been photoshopped, and it's very disappointing. It wastes a lot of our time in trying to analyze and, and figure out, you know, we're all searching for the smoking gun, that's mm -hmm. what we say, right? And that's been the big goal for people forever is to provide the concrete evidence that's irrefutable. And in this case, we spend hours and hours and hours every month trying to uncover which is true and which is not. So um, one of our club members, a student at UNO, took an independent study from me and did his study on uh, fractal analysis. And we, um, the, in our initial discussions, we put this towards um, radar data to try to enhance the radar data to get a finer mesh field. Because the, the, the real interesting thing about fractals, which is very helpful, is that in nature you have general patterns uh, throughout nature. And when you go down into, the, into a finer mesh, trying to zoom up, for example, onto an image or whatever, there is a repeatable pattern, and that's what the fractals are all about. And it actually generates these very unique data sets that you can visibly view and see lines and patterns into the zoomed up areas. And what's interesting, if an image hasn't been tampered with, like say an aircraft against the clouds, it all kind of blends together. And what's interesting about a tampered image is that they come from two different sources. So when you do fractal analysis on a faked image, it just pops right out of the paper. You can see where the lines have been cut and been literally spliced into the, the background image. So we've developed this new technique. We've run um, about, right at this point, about 35, 40 different test images through. And we were able to actually um, uncover um, images that have been photoshopped, which is the primary hoaxing techniques that are out there, uh, double exposures. And on, a, on photo emulsion is a, a double exposure or a, a photographic overlay. And we can actually see in the fractal mesh whether it's been tampered with or not in that regard. We're planning on writing an article to send to MUFON on our discovery. Because I don't know of anybody that's really doing this right now. No, not really. I know that uh, MUFON's guy, oh man, D'Antonio, he yes. has some different uh, things that he uses, but I wouldn't understand them at the level you would, so I don't know if they're similar at all. But it sounds very unique, and it's great. In fact, there's some couple cases I'm working on that I'd love to have you take a quick look at at least the pictures. Mm -hmm. Well, I, it, I've, been, uh, uh -huh. I've been asked by a, a number of groups to look at different images. Uh, I'm a meteorologist as well, mm -hmm. and, and so uh, I get a lot of these uh, uh, plate lenticular or lenticular cloud types, right. and a lot of people claiming that, you know, these are UFOs. Well, they're not. They're cloud formations, and mm -hmm. the way they're the way they're presented on a photo, uh, you know, for like a tenth of a second, you may think, well, you know, maybe there's something, and then you look at it again, it's a, it's a cloud. Um, <laughs> but many people can't, you know, discern that from the photo. And so it just takes somebody right. else that has some expertise in that area. And I've, and I've been trained as a, a photo interpreter as a, and a photogrammetrist. So I, I know all the older techniques in the uh, aspect ratios and how to determine heights and shadows and cast and all this type of thing. Um, but this new fractal technique, and, and, and it's all done from a free program called FractLab 2.0. You can download this off the internet, mm -hmm. but there's a procedural process that we use. You know, there's like 50 different algorithms that you could put into this thing. And um, well, what Matt Judah has come up with as um, uh, in his process is a uh, a series of uh, signal uh, smoothing techniques and uh, and then some transition techniques and then finally the, the final fractal processing that actually will display all these unique characteristics of an untampered versus the tampered. And it, like I said, it, this stuff just pops right out of the paper. 
And uh, with with my background and as uh, photo interpreting, um, you know, it's extremely easy to see this. And at our symposium that we had just uh, two weeks ago, uh, we actually did one. Uh, we actually did four images live at the symposium. I had no idea what they were, mm -hmm. and that's that's what we had planned to do. We gave a presentation on how do you do this, how do you use it, and then uh, during the symposium, um, Matt put up four different images that were provided to him. I didn't know what they were. Processed them. It takes like less than a minute, and then I looked at them, and within you know about 30 seconds or so, just examining on the big screen projector, which is not the greatest detail of the world, you know, in the world uh, to do this. But anyway, I was able to determine that these were fake. This one was real, and everybody was simply uh, amazed at the speed to which we could accomplish this. Mm -hmm. And in the past, it would you just be hours and hours of arguments uh well you know there's a little bit of lighting over here and there's a cast over there it looks real and then when you get really down into the finer uh details of this it, you come to the conclusion that this isn't real this is fake but this makes it so much more apparent it just eliminates a lot of the arguments now does this displace the fact that an untampered image is actually real Right. What it does is says that the image hasn't been tampered with, but that doesn't mean that what you're seeing in the image can't be disputed as far as like somebody threw a, hook, a hubcap up and it took a, a photo of the whole background because the fractals can't tell, you know, if it's a fake craft or not. I mean, but you can determine whether images are, uh, have not been tampered versus been hoaxed. Cool. Well, that's very excited. Uh, exciting. I'm excited to uh, see this write up in the MUFON Journal. Hopefully, you guys get that up. And I would love to lobby to have you present this at the uh, MUFON Symposium during their uh, their workshops for investigators. Well, um, you know, depending upon, I, I I teach a lot, and yeah. uh, I'm online. I'm in you know face to face and. Uh, I, I usually don't have lots of time right. uh, to do things. It's all it's all a process of scheduling, and if they were even interested, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that's, that's really what it kind of comes down to. Right. I hate to say, like, we're in our own little world at, uh, at UNO, but, uh, you know, we've been doing a lot of good work there, and it's, uh, you know, three years in the making. You know, we have three radio programs that we present every week. Uh, we call it Science Radio International. It's uh, sounds cool. <laughs> yeah, there isn't an organization like that, but it's it's the name that we came up with. And under under the guise of Science Radio International, we have the Quantum State, which I do, which is a physics uh, uh, relativity program. We we talk about late breaking news in science uh, from Science Daily, NASA, and a number of other sources that I get in across my desk almost every day through emails. And then we have uh, Spooky Action at a Distance, which is, uh, it's, uh, um, again, this, this program is more related to UFO phenomena, um, abductions, and things like that. And then we have another radio program called On the Fringe, which is the Paranormal Society's radio program. And then you talk about some of the latest case studies that are being done, things that are being done around the world, equipment that's being used, and things like this. And I talk on some of these programs um, on occasion, you know, they ask, they request that I go on and talk about something that I've, I've built or whatever. But mostly I, I pretty much uh, tend to the quantum state myself. Mm -hmm. And that gets uh, broadcast over the MAV radio network. It goes out on HD2 radio from the KVNO studio. And then it also goes across the internet. And uh, we have people who listen around the world i don't i wouldn't say that we would have probably an audience such as what you have uh, because we really don't advertise in that respect um it kind of goes word of mouth and uh yeah i did college radio actually and we were the mavs out there it's mesa state college well now they're oh, Colorado really? <laughs> mesa university but they were the the mavericks is that the the who you exactly are exactly what we are oh yeah, that's funny Yep. UNO Mavericks, uh-huh. Yep. Oh, cool. 
It is. And so we have the, like I said, the internet radio um, piece of this. And and we're doing almost 10 hours of program, I'm sorry, about eight hours of programming a week, uh, which takes up a lot of time. You know? Right. Yeah. Uh, I, so you guys are keeping extremely busy out there and doing a lot of really cool things, it sounds like. And I think what, you know, I it feels like I'm, I'm getting really excited talking to you because I love the science end of all of this. And it does feel like you are kind of your own island out there in the middle of the country um, doing a lot of good work and uh, putting the science together. And this is where I wanted to, to talk to you about and the similarities in the different uh, the equipment used for different parts of paranormal research. So I was wondering if you mm-hmm. could kind of go into when in UFO investigations, there's certain equipment they use for certain reasons. What out of that equipment also is used in paranormal investigations? Well, uh, believe it or not, uh, tri-field meters are very popular between paranormal and UFO uh, mm-hmm. because of the Gauss meter and also because of the um, being able to detect microwave or electric fields. Uh, these are very, very important in, in both sets of investigations. One, you're trying to analyze a room of what kind of properties are there. So if you do get EVPs onto your digital recorders, which we use in both uh, investigative processes as well um, to make sure that what you're picking up is uh, the real deal and it's not just um, you know potentially maybe you're picking up a radio broadcast in the background on a you know cross frequency so we actually check everything out when we go in to do a, uh, a field investigation for a, um, uh, for an intelligent haunts mm-hmm. okay um, and then on the opposite side for UFO investigation, we'd use the same equipment to see if there's any residual fields there uh, and or the um, digital recorder to interview the people and that. And the other thing we use, obviously, for um, UFO investigation is we have our radiation meters that we bring out into the field. Those are very, very important. Any kind of residual leftover radiation from a, uh, a landing or a... Um, an event that it flew near the ground or um, disrupted uh, grass. We have a had a case down in Lincoln, Nebraska, where there were actually grass swirls left from a overflight of a UFO. Wow! And we did get radiation counts down there, and we were called in about 48 hours after the event, and uh, we went down, took soil samples and that, and uh, took extensive photo. Um, pictures of the of the squirrels and laid out the grid and walked the grid and then went in with the radiation meter and the tri-field meter um, and we took all of our you know linear measurements with a tape measure and all this type of thing and wrote everything down in each square as we went in to you know eliminate contamination worked our way into the center and uh, you know um, a lot of that same equipment would be the same thing. I mean, you wouldn't think, why do you need a radiation meter uh, to go to a, you know, for a, a paranormal investigation? You never know what you're going to encounter, and you don't know what's causing the issue there. So it always pays to have a little bit more instrumentation than perhaps maybe you do need. Mm-hmm. Now, some of the unique things that we build is. <clears throat> A lot of the students and, and a lot of the members, they, they call this device the Paris portal. And, and it, sounds, <laughs> it sounds bizarre, but all we're doing is we ionize air. We found that when you have a lot of um, uh, solar winds and if there's thunderstorms in the area, we seem on the paranormal side to get more enhancement on our um, EVP uh, recordings. And... Uh, that is uh, uh, an enhancement, so we artificially induce it with our uh, portable Tesla coil. We have a couple of antennas set up, and we use a Tesla coil that's run on a battery, and we can go inside, outside, and set this up. And we've had very effective results with the um, EVP electronic uh, voice phenomena. Really? So, yes, yes. It's that's been, incredible. It, and, and we've also come up with a dampener 
one of the things that we were thinking about was, okay, you have a nasty. We call them nasties. <laughs> not Casper the Friendly Ghost, but we'll call him a nasty. And what if you wanted to get rid of him? And so I was thinking about this, and since I do electronics, and, you know, like I said, you know, I got a, a, a multidisciplined background. I came across, and I thought about this, and I said, what about putting a dampener up? So what we did was we built some, uh, like a screen antenna, and we uh, made a special ground to uh, a three, you know, three-prong plug. It just hooked up the ground. And uh, we had one of these ovuluses, um, well, they call them a TX box, but it, uh, it picks up electromagnetic waves and associates it to uh, a dictionary of words. And supposedly, we don't really know how this thing is designed, but it seems to kind of work. Um, however, you know, we're kind of all riding the fence on that one. But uh, the thing will utter a bunch of words, okay? Now, when we plug in this dampener, uh, it doesn't do anything. And when we unplug it, the thing starts chattering again. So it appears that whatever fields are in the room, and even during an EVP session with a digital recorder, we find that when we have the dampener in, that the EVPs go down as well. Um, we got one recording in, wow. in, a, in a room in the building, and it was a couple of kids, and it says, hey, let's do it again. And uh, there were no kids with us when we were making these recordings, okay? Uh, and we are able to uncover that with the Audacity software, which is free, you know, mm -hmm. off the Internet, and we use that extensively. And both groups use it, the UFO and the other, because if you're out there recording, and uh, one of our intentions is to have this laptop and all this suite of equipment hooked up to it, uh, it's going to monitor by itself, and we don't physically have to be there, so we could leave it up on the roof of a house or on the roof of the building, and the thing will actually activate itself, uh, motion detector, and turn on cameras. And uh, if you, you know, if we had a jolt in the Gauss field uh, from a tri-field meter, um, it would turn on the whole system, and we'd have a number of triggers set up, and then you start recording. And so one of the things would be not just voice and uh, uh, record digital recorders going on, but then to reduce the data after you get it. So if we did, maybe we would pick up a sound that we could analyze in, in addition to photos, webcams, and all this type of thing that you could access through a wireless network. So we're working on a lot of things, software, hardware, and we're, we're trying to develop things that um, are, are going to allow us to try to quantify what we're seeing to try to reduce this down to get irrefutable proof that there, there are UFOs, and there are ghosts out there, mm -hmm. intelligent ghosts that you uh, can communicate, ask questions, and get an answer. So it's a very intriguing. I, like I said, uh, we're um, we're not looking for trouble, but we're there to analyze. <laughs> and trouble. It's a comes. great group. Yeah, it's exciting. And there's a couple things I want to ask related to that. And let's see if I could you know, formulate sure. this question correctly, because these are, you know, pretty out there kind of ideas. But with the paranormal, it's more, I guess, of a, a natural type of phenomena, uh, the energies involved there that you're measuring, uh, whereas the UFO phenomena is more of a technology that someone seems to have developed. But it, would you say that this technology that's developed seems to... Sh um, demonstrate a mastery of the natural phenomena that you're also measuring um, on the paranormal side. There's a relation there that seems pretty important. Uh, yes, I, I think that there's a, um, there is a, uh, a correlation of, of the various kinds of fields that um, on the other side that has the ability to communicate to reality here. And how that works is still, uh, you know, we're still investigating that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hate making, you know, just throwing out theories that don't pan out and that. Right. But, but there are peer, we, we have worked on that aspect of it, of building the comparator. In other words, we have um, a series of coils 
tuned differently, uh, different for different frequencies. And uh, like a dynamic microphone in a uh, digital recorder, it appears that EVPs can be enunciated or impressed onto the digital recorder as we speak. And when you put it on Audacity, you'll see human voice going up and down, huge amplification of our of the voice signals as it projects onto the screen um, when we're analyzing it. But yet the EVPs hang like very tightly along the center line of the voice uh, sound waves. Mm -hmm. And that's where we find these things. And uh, what we're trying to do is develop a comparator system that is just a coil. And the EVPs, as we think that we understand, is a magnetic impression. In other words, there's a there's um, the energy field that they supposedly can command or control uh, will generate a magnetic field that can actually get impressed to the dynamic microphone of a digital recorder. And if you can get that to also impress through a coil to a a recorder that that has been by the microphone's been bypassed, you now have two different um, tracks that have been laid in that can be compared. So if you get an EVP on the dynamic mic, you should be able to get the EVP onto the coil. That is, there's no human voice on there. And whatever you do get will be then, there should be identical, I guess that's what I'm trying to say, mm -hmm. and to make the comparisons. And we're working on that right now. We have a little bit of problem with 60 cycle uh, tones in there. Uh, kind of distorting the signal on our coils, and we're um, putting in a filter there. But once we accomplish that next task, um, we'll actually have a comparator. And so that will prove that the EVPs that we're getting are not background noises. Uh, they're not, you know, uh, uh, faked. Um, it's not people whispering and all this type of thing because you'll have them uh, being imprinted onto a coil which has no ability to receive human sound waves. So right. that's, that's going to that's be extremely exciting when we perfect that system to analyze both um, um, recordings that are taken simultaneously. Yeah. I think what I think uh, one thing I think is interesting about the you know the the kind of uh, areas where these different phenomena meet. Now I I typically you know I really stick to UFOs on this show and with my yeah. having UFO mm -hmm. daily news. But I'm really into the paranormal. In fact, you know I've been doing that investigation for a long time. I write for that. I write for all paranormal for uh, Huffington Post a, a blog. So. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that ca I came across, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Now, this is speculative. This is out there, and you never know when it comes to channelings and stuff like that. Right. But an abductee, and this was an interesting concept, and uh, I was involved with, well, Dr. Leo Sprinkle, who you're involved with, he was, the, or who you know, I'm sure. Of, yes, yes. He was the one doing the regression, and I was present, and I got to ask some questions and whatever was coming across, it could have been the subconscious of, of the person who is being regressed, but asking some questions around the, what they perceive. And they talked about a, a type of being that is uh, non-physical, that has something to do with humans that they can't communicate with, but somehow these things have a strong connection with us. And they say they have the ability to um their perception is wider than ours so they can see these things they can hear these things at times but they don't know what they're up to because they can't communicate with them and it, it kind of sounds like a medium you know and it would kind of make sense that perhaps if there are these um uh, these beings with a, a stronger grasp on some of these technologies uh that they might be better ghost hunters, for lack of a better term, and they would be able to detect these things. And I mean, that cross crossing of these two arenas is so wild to me, but it seems to make sense. I mean, that that would be the case, that uh, 
if we well, with technology are are able to capture these things and them with the more advanced technologies they would be able to um, observe these things that are unseen to us better now we've had a lot of open discussion about uh, possibilities and one of the things that a lot of us are into are entangled particles and actually spooky action at a distance is the result of Einstein's saying <laughs> is that entangled mm -hmm. particles uh, spooky action at a distance uh, as you know as, uh, as he evolved and developed really the basics of uh, quantum physics even though that he didn't like it <laughs> right <laughs> he didn't want anybody to upset his his realm of relativity but he's the guy who actually uh, uh, between him and, and, and Neil Bohr, you know, gets this thing rolling. But um, we've always wondered about uh, the possibility, and as science has rolled on, we we know that there's more than just uh, photonic uh, particle entanglement, but you can actually have entanglement with atoms. And that's been the latest, uh, that's been one of the latest breakthroughs in uh, uh, particle entanglement. Um, and I find this really fascinating because I've often wondered uh, telepathic um, abilities between people. Uh, if there isn't a, uh, an entanglement of uh, a chemical entanglement or, in a sense, uh, kind of a uh, potentially electron particle entanglement between humans that would cross vast distances and relate information back. I think we all have potentially, and again, this, this is way out there, okay? I'm not, <laughs> I can't confirm this, but it's this, it's highly speculative. But uh, it, it would seem to me is that in nature, if these things exist, and we've been able to show that it does among photons and atoms, that you can get not only um, two particles uh, in entanglement, but there's also been proof of quadrilar entanglement, which means if you can do quadrilar, then you should be able to do multiple entanglement of um, uh, certain atoms or, in this case, perhaps uh, electrons in, in the brain. Um, and so I'm kind of, you know, s extrapolating out there. But there has to be an explanation of why people can send their thoughts or aliens being able to tell pathways communicate to humans through the brain there has to be uh, a relationship there you know nature doesn't pull a lot of punches you know what I mean the physics mm -hmm. has to be the same um, for the interactive pieces of that so if you can do it on to an atomic level and um, you know uh, to an energy packet level in this case a photon there wouldn't be any reason why you could not do that between humans and and uh, evolve or stimulate or create this artificial induce some type of mental entanglement between people I don't you know I'm throwing it out there but it, right. it seems it seems possible I guess it wouldn't be totally improbable and I'm just kind of based on that off of you know trying to utilize some logic here that uh, uh, like for example uh, uh, the anomaly of space warp not to try to change the subject or anything, but I'm just saying is that if these things do occur on an, as an anomaly in nature, then we should be able to exercise these things uh, with the proper inducement to artificially induce, quote, space warp, for example. And like I said, nature is, it doesn't have all these various exceptions. It's kind of a cookie cutter. You know, planets are made in a particular manner. Uh, stars are made in a particular manner. There, there may be different sizes, different masses, uh, different outputs, but they all run the same way. And they all have fusion process, you know. Uh, planetoids, uh, the fact that the, the suns take the, uh, a, a star takes all the uh, lighter um, particles, uh, such as uh, hydrogen and whatnot, and fuses that together and leaves the heavier elements in the nebula um, outside of the star, and that, those are left over for the, quote, interior metal planets that we have seen here, but we've also seen across with the Hubble Space Telescope. So it's, uh, it's not that unusual. Our solar system is, uh, is very normal 
in, in respect to the kind of processes that go on throughout the universe. We're not really all that unique. Well, we're not unique, <laughs> other than the fact that we're, you know, way out there in our universe about three quarters of the way, and uh, we sit in a kind of an idle place uh, where not a lot goes on, and, and uh, i.e., we are able to survive, uh, you know, 4.6 billion years. But what, getting back to the in, entanglement in that, I'm, I'm just trying to present the case that nature doesn't really vary a whole lot once you find a procedure pretty much duplicates these things in, a, in the array that uh, it goes through, or the process that it goes through. Getting to some more of the science there, uh, you had mentioned a bit, and we should get there, the space warp. Yes. Because that's mm -hmm. very interesting uh, work that you've done. Ex explain the space warp to us, I guess, and, and how it's been observed in nature. Okay. Uh, the, um, the case studies that I actually have uh, are related to pilots. And what, what's unique about this is that the, um, the, the cases that I have cover from World War II to 1970 is my latest one that we have lots of evidence about. But the, uh, starting in World War II, uh, we have a, an RAF pilot named O'Brien flying over England in a Tiger Moth doing some radar uh, tracking with the aircraft during the war gets caught up into a thunderstorm, and suddenly he feels like the aircraft is going to get ripped apart. He flies, he sees a light into the thunderstorm, and he flies his aircraft towards the light. It opens up his, into a tunnel, and he believes that he can see the sea on the other side of this. He's flying in southern England, and uh, he flies into the tunnel, and he ends up um, coming out into an area that are hundreds of miles away from where he's supposed to be in a tiger moth. <laughs> and he, he writes this down. Um, he actually felt that he was in the hands of God, as he writes in, into this uh, the letter that I received from his son. Uh, actually just narrated parts of it. And he thought he was doomed. And uh, he flies into the tunnel. He comes out. He lands back at his base thinking that he was days late, and he said, no, you're on time. Um, and so this was a weird occurrence. Well, he just keeps it kind of to himself there, writes all this uh, information up, writes it into a letter, and, you know, yeah, told his family about it. Well, in the 1950s, we have Arthur Goffrey, who experienced, he was a Navy pilot. I don't know if you realize that. Uh, he was an entertainer, yes, uh, very famous. But he was also a Navy pilot. He was checked out in every naval aircraft into the um, uh, during the war and after the war. And he was uh, uh, an expert navigator and, and everything else that goes with that. He was flying from Alaska to Japan, and he encounters uh, in the story that he tells a UFO comes up near his craft and then disappears, and then suddenly he gets in, enveloped in a um, kind of a cloud that adheres to the aircraft, and he ends up arriving in Japan a half hour earlier than what he's supposed to. All right, well, he is kind of stuck in a quandary. You know, who, who's going to believe this? So he only tells this story to a, a handful of people over his lifetime. And we get up to 1966, Lieutenant Frank Hopkins, and uh, he's flying a C-97, He's a master navigator. He's a colonel in the Air Force and the Air National Guard at this point out of New York. And they're flying from Kwajalein to Guam. And uh, this is about a six and a half hour trip. They make it in five hours. And as he checks his waypoints, he finds that one waypoint, he has gone 300 miles in an hour. <laughs> it's impossible to do in a <laughs> I mean, this thing is like a lumbering brick, you know, with four engines on it. And uh, so he's gone beyond his waypoint, 300 miles downrange, lands early. They talk about it at this operation shack, and they never enter it into the log books. But he writes about this, and uh, he eventually sends a letter to Argosy Magazine in 1968 talking about his experience.
And he used he warp technology. Uh, well, unwittingly. This is, <laughs> this is exactly where I'm headed here with the with the evidence here. And and you the best case that I have. Now these kind of you know there's circumstantial evidence there. Um, you know, it, is it exact? Eh, well, you know, I don't have specific dates. I've got you know generalities here. Mm-hmm. But the Bruce Gernon case, 1970. That's for December 1970. He takes off from West Palm Beach. He flies down to uh, Andros Island. His dad is there, another business associate. They're, they're looking into um, building a resort down on Andros Island. This, and the Navy has a, a, a research center down there, kind of like the Area 51 of the Navy in mm-hmm. a sense. Uh, and he's down there. But the thing to remember is when you fly into Andros Island, it takes about 75 minutes to go from West Palm Beach down to Andros Island. In the behind the uh, in the quote the triangle, <laughs> you land there. There's no fuel, so whatever you fly in with is what you fly out with. Okay. Next day, they get done with their business and they're flying back. They get wrapped up into a bunch of thunderstorms surrounds the airplane, and there's two last thunderstorms that are forming in this ring. As they form up, a tunnel appears. Now, some people call it a step tunnel. Uh, some people call it a sucker hole. And at this time, uh, he's flying around, and he's trying to evade these thunderstorms. He can't fly under them. They're already to the surface of the ocean. And he's try- he can't fly over them because these things have expanded up to 65,000 feet in altitude. That's- and that's not unusual down there, you know, for thunderstorms to go up that high because, you know, the atmosphere is a lot thicker down there. Anyway, he, go- he ends up taking the plane through at 10,000 feet through this hole. And he, uh, the hole is probably, you know, somewhere about 10 or more miles long. He actually goes, enters, enters the hole and gets out of the hole in about 20 seconds. And something begins to happen to the airplane. The engine's still running and everything's normal in the plane, except now all the instrumentation is going out. And as he exits the hole, a white cloud adheres to the aircraft, sticks to it. And he disappears off a of radar, and he's near Bimini Island at this point. And he makes a call on his radio uh, several seconds later after this occurrence, and he's able to actually make a radio transmission, and the cloud dis- dissipates around the airplane, and he's over Miami Beach. And the controller from Miami says, uh, I got an aircraft south of the field here over Miami Beach. And he says, like, can't be me, as he's making this call and talking back and forth. He says, can't be me. I'm at Bimini Island. And he goes, well, there is no aircraft at Bimini Island. There's one over Miami Beach. And so as he recognizes the, you know, the, the ground beneath him, uh, he then continues on to West Palm Beach. He lands. He took off at 3 o'clock. He lands at 347. And this is a 75-minute uh, trip. And he's actually traveled 250 miles already, you know, for this entire trip. And it's normally like 210. So bottom line is, how does he, he would have to have gone 319 miles an hour in order to make the trip in 47 minutes. He, he uh, goes over to the refueling pumps, as he would normally do after every completion of a flight, and he tops the tanks off. He has... He puts in the, the fuel, and he usually uses like 32 gallons of fuel to make these round trips. And the bottom line is he has nine extra gallons of fuel on board that he didn't expend. And so he's got the refueling tickets. we got his log books. we got his flight map. we got the testimony from the two other people in the plane. Uh, we got people seeing him take off. we got people seeing him land. Uh, he thought it was some kind of time warp but as the research has gone on it um, and particularly this is a a theoretical physics problem at least in the beginning when we begin to look at this and this is a this is a process that uh, Miguel Alcubierre in 1994 came up with as a uh, theoretical um, possibility to allow spacecraft to travel faster than uh, the speed of light. And uh, with this, what his emphasis is, is that if you have enough energy around a craft, it gets uh, put into what he referred to as a space warp bubble. 
And within that bubble, the crew would not experience any kind of momentum. Uh, they would have an experience of a, of a slight feeling of weightlessness. And there would be like tidal actions on the exterior of this bubble. And there would be the, literally the compression of the fabric of space in front of the craft. And then it would expand up and around the craft, pushing it um, through the fabric of space. Now, this fabric of space doesn't extend hundreds and thousands of miles. We're only talking like about a half an inch, perhaps, or less of actually compressing the fabric of space. But it's like taking a piece of paper, putting a dot at the bottom and the top, and folding the paper, and you're transiting between those two dots. And the, the compression of the space is you, you've just traversed a linear distance. It's not anything to do with velocity. Okay, so this doesn't violate anything in relativity. So, you know, you realize that, you know, as, as you speed up towards the speed of light, you know, you'll require more and more fuel, your mass increases, and, and supposedly as the theory goes, you know, you can never, you could approach the speed of light, but you can never exceed it, okay? Well, this has nothing to do with that. This is more uh, deals with a linear distance of travel over a compressed fabric portion of space. So it really has nothing to do with velocity as it does with the compression. And in my seminar that we just had, you know, two weeks ago, my suggestion was, I, I believe after uh, reviewing lots of materials about UFOs and their sudden appearance and disappearance, in other words, you know, just going and away they go and you can see them moving, I believe is that they have perfected um, this artificial inducement of the fabric of space or space warp to such a degree it's almost like using a gas pedal in a car that you can manipulate it to go very slow or you can use it to go extremely fast and the projection here for fabric of space or the space warp is uh, something in the neighborhood of a thousand times the speed of light it could even be more than that we don't know Mm -hmm. But that's been the projection, the theory about it. Now, now with these the, pilots, did they run across art of, or natural kind of tears in the fabric of space? Well, what, what happened with these guys, and this is the beauty of it, being the meteorologist, okay, here's the meteorologist coming out. Thunderstorms. We've, we've learned just this uh, in uh, January of 2010, there's been some experiments and observations since 2007 about posit uh, thunderstorms and the generation of positrons, antimatter. And as a result of all the electrical charge inside the storm, uh, these the thunderstorms generate trillions of these positrons. And it was detected with the Fermi spacecraft. And the beauty of this the, and the irony of it is the Fermi spacecraft was designed to look for antimatter out in the universe. And they didn't realize, and they should have turned the thing around. <laughs> because they would have found that the Earth is loaded with antimatter, more antimatter than anywhere else that they've been able to detect in the universe. Hmm. And uh, the fact that these thunderstorms are generating this thing on, on a day-to-day -day basis means that there is sufficient energy that induces, it's the triggering mechanism that I believe induces these micro space warps, or let's, let's call them um, um, uh, space warp pulses, they only last for a fraction of a second, perhaps. They don't go on for any big length of time. But it's enough to shoot these airplanes out of the thunderstorms in these environments uh, about 100 miles or a few hundred miles. In the case of the C-97, 300 miles. And these aircraft, you would think, would have been destroyed. And, uh, you know, the A-36 Beach Bonanza that Bruce Gernon was flying in 1970, the wings fall off at 220 or 230 miles an hour. Hmm. Um, and in this case, I calculated the, the distance, and I used the second, which is probably more than what actually occurred as far as time goes. Um, but in that calculation of 100 miles, that's 360,000 miles an hour. I mean, <laughs> you, you would think, well, the motor should have stopped, the wings should have fell off. He was in a bubble. Yeah. There's no way that that plane could have gone that distance without some kind of physical damage to it if it was anything other than space warp. 
sometimes other people have always been saying it's like time travel. You meet a triangle issue, you know, somehow there's an anomaly of, of uh, time travel there. Well, we did the calculation, and it is not time travel. It, he was in he was in uh, communications with ground control. If it was something to do with time travel, then there would have been a distortion between when he transmitted to when the ground observer transmitted back. And all of that was in sync. So that means that it wasn't time travel. It's the logical reduction of what, what occurred here. But more likely, and the evidence points to this, is that it was space warp. And believe it or not, all the different criteria that Miguel Cuvier cited that should happen during space warp travel is what he physically felt and what he experienced in his small little transit mm -hmm. of a microsecond and going 100 miles. And what was interesting is that nobody could see his airplane until the fog, this ionized cloud, clung to his airplane. But the energy from the, from the thunderstorm as it pushed this thing 100 miles, nobody could see his airplane. And it wasn't until the cloud dissipated that the control tower said, oh, we can see an airplane flying over, not only on radar, but we can visibly see an aircraft over Miami Beach. So there was a lot of interesting things that, that go with this particular um, trip that these guys made. Uh, invisibility uh, is one of the issues here, or the um, uh, destructive interference of light in this uh, warp bubble. Uh, the fact that there was no real extensive tidal actions, uh, in other words, no disruptions onto the ocean floor, on the off ocean surface, nor in the atmosphere, causing any kind of anomalies. Um, and the fact that um, he didn't expend all the fuel he normally would have, um, that again, time travel, mm, you know, but this really relates back to the space warp, and, and I got his, his uh, copies of all of his documents, and, and the, the refueling uh, ticket is probably the, the most convincing of everything, okay? Mm -hmm. The fact that he refueled, we knew where he went, where he had come back with, how much fuel he had on board, and the fact that he actually had gone an additional 40 miles to try to avoid some of these thunderstorms and that and uh, changing paths, changing altitudes. A very intriguing case. Now, and, yeah. uh, this happened, if this is what happened, um, and it happens in nature, how difficult is it to uh, create then, uh, like what the UFOs are doing, an artificial space warp? Do we have the technology to do it if we were able to obtain the know-how? I'm working on that. I got. I, I believe that there is. You're going to space warp a student across, the, across <laughs> Nebraska. No, actually, in my little lab here that I have uh, set up, I'm I'm doing some um, micro warp experiments. Mm -hmm. And what I've done, I'm a ham radio operator, and uh, I've got uh, a transmitter and some and two different two dipole antennas. And what I'm trying to simulate is a field pattern that clouds would make in thunderstorms because they actually create dipole fields. In other words, energy comes out of the top, comes around the side, circulates back to the bottom, and actually goes around. It, again, nature doesn't pull any punches here. So in, in a radiating antenna, uh, an omnidirectional antenna does exactly the same thing. It comes out of the top, it radiates around, and goes back to the bottom. has the same kind of flow. And so what I've done is I've set up two different uh, dipole antennas, and the object here is to irradiate um, into a Faraday cage, and I have a, a modified Michelson-Morley experiment. It's an interferometer, and the object here. Now, this is the tough part. You can't go to Kmart and go buy any of this stuff, right? you got to build everything, right? So this has taken a lot of time to do and align and modify these experiments. Uh, i got a laser. I've got the beam splitter. i got the reflective mirrors, and i got the screen up there. And, and the screen in this particular experiment is sensitive to like you know uh, one to thirty six hundredth of a of a fraction to to see a fringe pattern and and that's how sensitive this thing is 
So the object of the experiment is to align the laser up into the sweet point of the cross patterns of the dipole field of where this, quote, tunnel would be. Because I've actually done the analysis with um, uh, ham radio software, antenna software, and you can actually cross two dipole fields and you'll see the center, you see the cross points of this tunnel that's actually generated in this thing. And that's what I'm trying to achieve. And I've got to be able to manipulate the platform so it goes up and down and the laser goes right into the sweet spot. So that, that's been the difficult part. Um, I guess maybe to a lot of people it wouldn't be, but uh, you know, you're, we're working with some very limited amount of power, you know, about 100 watts of power, and, uh, and finding that little tiny spot, micro, would be the point. And what I'm looking for is a fringe pattern of distortion as this laser goes through the tunnel. And that would give me the indications. It would make me extremely excited hmm. that not only can you induce this artificially, that we carry this up to a, a bigger model, but I've also determined the various uh, weather parameters that would be necessary to induce this as a weather phenomena. So I've studied um, over 50 different flights of aircraft that disappeared, and I um, took randomly 23 cases out of the 50 to analyze, and I found a pattern um, beginning to come out of the data and that was a particular set of weather parameters of when these aircraft disappeared. Now, fortunately, I got some pilots that actually lived through a bunch of this stuff. But the trend tendency was uh, a unique situation between high and low pressure systems where you had easterly flow. And, it, I, and I did a lot of my study work right off the uh, east coast of Miami there. And uh, that's where a lot of these planes went down. And I found a pattern beginning to evolve. Uh, and the fact was that these thunderstorms, these very independent thunderstorms, would occur off the east coast of Miami. First, in the Key West, you begin to see some towering cumulus, some unstable air conditions. And by about 11 o'clock in the morning, these uh, independent, isolated thunderstorms would form off east of Miami, out on, over the ocean uh, uh, surface. And by afternoon, these things were huge. Uh, and, and based off the, the date and time of the um, archive data, they all were showing the same processes going on there, always between the, uh, which we would call a call area, between the high and low pressure systems of two major fronts, um, or two major systems of the high and low. But there's a transitionary area between there, which is a, called the coal or transition zone, which has light and verbal winds, which is ideal for thunderstorm development. And again, the archive data indicates that these storms up, um, appear when you have easterly flow over, the, um, over Florida, and you have less than 10 degrees separation between temperature and dew point, and you have an easterly wind of less than uh, 10 knots. And in every situation, the same phenomena of thunderstorms occurred. And, and couple that with the positronic uh, uh, development inside of a thunderstorm, the electrical discharges, the um, bidirectional flow of energy from ground to space and from space to ground, and the uh, addition of uh, the solar winds, and uh, directly related to the amount of sunspots being created on the sun, but the solar wind uh, patterns as they come across the heliosphere. And there are, again, a variety of different criteria that we use to look at this. But when all of this energy is coupled and it actually can affect these isolated thunderstorms, this is the inducement that I believe that I found as far as the uh, meteorological parameters, the inducement that uh, we can forecast to actually recreate the situation for Bruce's aircraft uh, involvement in his case. And I've got a uh, proposal out there right now. I'm trying to get a network to, um, to fund this. I'm working with a producer, Bruce Burgess, over in England. You may have heard of him. 
Area 51. He's done a number of uh, independent productions and things. Hmm. He, he's been in the business for like, you know, well over 25 years. And uh, I don't know if you remember in, in one of his uh, uh, documentaries that he did uh, about Area 51, he was the guy who was in the airplane getting chased by an f Yeah, that was a big one because that was one of the first real <laughs> popular documentaries. <laughs> That's Bruce Burgess. It, there, there's a whole other story behind it. He and I have talked hours and hours and, about things, and he is a great, he's a great guy. But that that episode, he said he needed a shovel after he got, he got that yeah, back down he got on the ground. Yeah, freaked out. <laughs> Who wouldn't? But anyway, uh, I'm working with him, and we're trying to um, uh, get funding for phase two research, which is. Uh, exactly what I just described to you is the, uh, being able to forecast the, the weather parameters, and then we're going to uh, construct a, a UAV, an unmanned aerial vehicle. We're going to convert like a Piper 140, uh, Piper Cherokee 140, PA 140, and we're going to um, put the automated control systems in there, mount up all the instrumentation, that we have, I've designed for it and uh, can acquire off the shelf any of these pieces and parts. And then at the proper moment is we'll have chase aircraft on either side of these thunderstorms. We'll look for the sucker hole. And there are various criteria that we can use electronically to begin to uh, analyze in the air at that moment of whether to commit the aircraft or not. Gamma rays, you see gamma rays is a direct uh, byproduct of uh, antimatter, and uh, the fact that we have sensors that can actually pick that up, we'll be able to find the sweet point in the thunderstorm, direct the aircraft, and hopefully we do see a tunnel, and we can then penetrate and then replicate this on the other side, where the aircraft then displaces whatever mileage that it goes. But it's only going to be for like a microsecond. Wow. And that's all. We, that's all we care about. Right. Okay. And that's, we, that's all that's safe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and the thing is, I, you know, like uh, um, Bruce Gernon has volunteered to be one of the chase pilots because he understands this phenomenon more uh -huh. than anybody else because he survived through two different uh, encounters of this stuff. Wow. And, uh, uh, and, and actually, I've flown with him. I've met with him. I've interviewed him. Uh, actually, as it turns out, we're great friends now. <laughs> so. This has been a, an intriguing case for me personally for well over seven years as I evolved and, and developed um, uh, uh, the research and uh, looked at all the information. And then uh, over the last uh, four years was uh, to be involved with Bruce and uh, making these uh, well, uh, yeah, pro it's, programs and everything. And, it's fascinating. So among all the – no wonder why you're so busy. You're, you're teaching all these classes. You're doing these radio shows. You're building a Stargate in your garage. Stargate. So you're a busy fella. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I'd call it. <laughs> the first Stargate. prototype. Sure, maybe um, the first time you only go a couple hundred miles, but uh, well, yeah. who knows what the potential is. Well, micro warp, it, it really, you know – it's amazing how many people sit on the sideline looking at this mm -hmm. and are all going, you do it first. You know, you yeah. spend all your money. You, uh, you know, mortgage your house and go and basically go bankrupt trying to prove this. And then after you do that, then we'll kind of swoop in and then, uh, you know, oh, now we now that we know we it's can do this. kind of the this, way it goes, huh? Yeah. Well, that's the way of most inventors. So yeah. I, 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 the way I look at it is that I'm writing a book. Uh, I know, you know, I'm real busy, but I, I'm, I'm writing a book and I'm trying to get this thing finished so that any proceeds that I get from this book, I can, because I don't really anticipate anybody giving us any kind of money. And so we're going to have to go this alone. And uh, I feel that the book would be, you know, with all the accumulation of all the cases and the evidence that we have, uh, experiments that I'm doing in the lab right now, that the book would more than satisfy a lot of people's curiosity and interest. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the proceeds, like I said, from that would then hopefully give us enough money. Uh, you know, we're looking at, you know, we need minimally about a quarter million dollars to do this, mm -hmm. um, this um, ongoing research. Well, to go we're down pretty there. much out of time right now. 
Yeah. But uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. And I think there's definitely several other topics I'd love to have you on again in the future. I'm oh, yeah. definitely going to be staying in touch and uh, sending you some emails <laughs> to look at some <laughs> stuff for me. But it was okay. just great to have you on the show and to meet you for the, the first time uh, virtually here over over the the Internet. But uh, thank you so much. You betcha. And then uh, at uh, Omaha Study Group is where OmahaUFOStudyGroup.com is where people can go listen to these shows and then find out more. Exactly. And uh, uh, the uh, Paris uh, Weather Research is another website that you can go to. And, uh, and uh, you can read the stories that have, I've uh, put together, the evidence, the data, and all that type of thing. And it uh, won't be as good as the book. <laughs> yeah, the book's going to be great. We'll have you on to tell us about how great it is. And it's uh, exciting stuff. Yes, it is. And I, and I do appreciate you uh, having me on. And uh, it, it's been a lot of fun. Anytime we can talk about UFOs, paranormal, uh, space warp, hey, I am, I'm up there. You know? Great. <laughs> I'm just uh, happier than all get out. What a cool professor. If there were more university professors like him, there would be more people with uh, degrees out there. So very cool guy. I love that guy. Thank you, David uh, Parrish, for being on the show. And thank you all for listening. We'll be back again next week. Until then, be sure to uh, visit openminds.tv and check out ufodailynews.com and all of our tweets because we're tweeting news like crazy. Uh, you can see those at the news feed at ufodailynews.com. Thanks for joining us, and we will talk to you again next week. Adios, muchachos. Bye.